Good morning and welcome to the lecture for Chapter 3 in the EMT textbook for the summer EMT class at Flathead Valley Community College. This lecture involves the issues of medical, legal, and ethical decision making that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. After you complete this chapter and the related coursework, you should understand the ethical responsibilities and the medical legal directives and guidelines pertinent to you as an EMT. Your approach to patient care relating to confidentiality, consent to treatment, refusal of care, and advanced directives will be explained. Organ donor systems and policies, evidence preservation, and end of life issues will also be discussed in this chapter. The National EMS Education Standard Competencies state that for the preparatory, as we talked about before, an EMT, upon completion of this course, will be able to apply fundamental knowledge of the emergency medical services system, safety, well-being of an EMT, medical, legal, ethical issues to the provision of care. These are all the things we'll talk about. When we talk about medical, legal, and ethics, we are going to talk about the consent to care or the refusal of care, confidentiality, advanced directives, tort and criminal actions, they're different, evidence preservation, statutory responsibilities under law, mandatory reporting, ethical principles, moral obligations, and end-of-life issues. A basic principle of emergency care is that we do no further harm. Do no harm is one of the mottos of EMS. A health care provider usually avoids legal exposure if he or she acts in good faith and according to the appropriate standard of care for the profession. Emergency medical care or immediate care or treatment is often provided by an EMT. The EMT is the first link in the chain of pre-hospital care and providing competent emergency care that conforms with the standard of care taught to you will help you avoid both civil, civil and criminal actions in a court of law. Litigation against EMS participants will no doubt increase due to the wider availability of emergency medical care and the more complex the care is. The first portion of medical legal that we want to talk about is consent. Consent, basically, is the permission to render care. A person must give consent for treatment and it has to be informed. If the patient is conscious and rational and capable of making an informed decision, they have the right to refuse care. The foundation of consent is decision-making capacity. The patient must be able to understand and process information provided to them and they can make an informed choice regarding medical care that is appropriate for them. Patient autonomy is the patient's right to make decisions about his or her health and their care that they receive. In determining a patient's decision-making capacity, the things an EMT will need to consider are is the patient's intellectual capacity impaired by mental limitations or dementia? Do they have some type of mental issue or dementia that causes them to not be competent to make those decisions? Are they of legal age? In most states, this is 18 years old. Is the patient impaired by alcohol, drugs, serious illness, or injury? This is one of the big issues we face because alcohol, drugs, injuries and illnesses can make patients to have issues with decision making. Does the patient appear to be experiencing significant pain? Are there any apparent hearing or visual problems? Is there a language barrier? Does the patient appear to understand what you are telling them? Do they ask you rational questions um, that may demonstrate an understanding of the information you are trying to share? These are all things that we must focus on when we talk about consent. The first type of consent is expressed consent that you need to know about. This is what we see probably 95% of the time or so. Expressed consent is where the patient acknowledges that he or she wants you to provide care or transport. To be valid, the patient must provide informed consent, which means you have explained the treatment being offered along with the risks, benefits, and alternatives, 
as well as the potential consequences of refusing treatment. Informed consent is valid if it's given orally. It does not have to be in writing. And you always document when a patient provides informed consent or have someone witness the patient's consent. Many times in our job, people think, well, they called an ambulance. Of course they want us to help. That is not consent. The request for an ambulance to come does not form that expressed and informed consent a patient must give. You do have to explain to them treatment risks and benefits of what you're doing. Um, some of the things you can do is, hi, Mrs. Jones, my name is Chris. I'm a paramedic with the ambulance. What's going on with you today? And start gathering information. As you do that, you say, well, I would like to check your pulse. Is it okay if I do that? Everything that we do, we need to do by informing. And that is when a patient is awake, conscious, and can make those decisions. That's expressed consent. The next type of consent we're going to talk about is implied consent. Implied consent is different because it applies to those patients who are unconscious and who are otherwise incapable of making a rational informed decision about care. Implied consent applies only when a serious medical condition exists. It should never be used unless there is a threat to life or limb. Sometimes the thing about this is what represents a serious threat is unclear and it may become a legal question. It is a really good idea to try to get consent from a spouse or relative before treating based on implied consent. Okay. The principle of implied consent is known as the emergency doctrine. And that's something you need to be aware of, that there is something that will protect you as a care provider um, regarding consent if the patient meets these um, criteria. Involuntary consent applies to patients who are mentally ill, in some type of behavior or psychological crisis, who may be developmentally delayed. These are the things that apply to involuntary consent. It is very important, if at all possible, you obtain consent from the guardian or a conservator for the patient. It's not always possible to do this, so understand what your local provisions are. For example, many states have protective custody statutes that allow such a person to be taken under law enforcement authority to a medical facility. EMTs generally never have this um, protective custody statute. It does apply to law enforcement. However, we do work with law enforcement quite closely on these types of calls. Minors and consent. The parent or legal guardian can give consent for anyone under the legal age to consent. In some states, the minor can actually give consent. It depends on their age and maturity, and there is a criteria here that we'll want to talk about. Whether a minor gives consent um, does depend on this, and the confusion surrounds the issue of emancipated minors. Okay, An emancipated minor is somebody who is under the legal age in a given state, but because of other circumstances is legally considered an adult. In Montana, emancipation must be ordered by the court. So anyone who is an emancipated minor is not just because, oh, I'm 17 and I can take care of myself, or oh, I'm married. Married does apply here, but I'm 17, I live on my own, my parents aren't around, I can take care of myself. It is court ordered in Montana, and they have to have the paperwork. Many states consider minors to be emancipated if they are married, if they are members of the armed services, or if they are parents. So in other words, if you have a 17-year-old woman who is a parent of a small child, then she is considered emancipated because she is a parent. Teachers and school officials may act in place of parents. This is called in loco parentis. And they can provide consent for treatment to injuries that occur in a school or camp setting. This is why when your kids go to school, your parents sign off an emergency treatment form so that in the event something happens and they can't reach the parents, this can be taken care of quickly. If a true emergency exists and no consent is available, the consent to treat the minor is implied just, with a, just as with an adult. If you can't reach them, then you can um, treat them under implied consent. Never withhold life-saving care for a minor because a person authorized to provide consent is not available. The next topic we're going to focus on is forcible restraints. Sometimes it is necessary with a patient who is in need of medical treatment and transportation but is combative and they present a significant risk of danger to himself, herself, or others for us to restrain the patient. Forcible restraint in these circumstances is legally permissible. 
You need to consult medical control for authorization, and in some states, only law enforcement officer may forcibly restrain. In Montana, we have the ability to forcibly restrain patients who are combative for our own protection, but this must be documented. Restraint without legal authority exposes you to potential civil and criminal penalties, and be sure you know local law about forcible restraint. The next section we're going to talk about is the right to refuse treatment. An adult who is conscious, alert, and appears to have decision-making capacity has the right to refuse treatment even if the result can be death or serious injury. They can withdraw from treatment at any time, even if the result is death or serious injury. A lot of times we see this in motor vehicle crashes where we tell them we want to put them on a backboard and in a cervical collar and they don't want it. They can do that. They can still go to the hospital with us. You just need to document the refusal of the backboard. You need to have them sign a form. It places the burden on the EMT to clarify the need for treatment. This puts us in a dilemma. Should you provide care against their will or should you leave them alone? Calls involving refusal of treatment are commonly litigated, that means they go to court in EMS and require you to proceed very cautiously. You must be familiar with your local policies. You need to involve, involve your online medical control physician. A patient, a parent, or a caregiver's decision to accept or refuse treatment should be based on the information that you provide. You need to tell them what your assessment findings were and what might be wrong with them. You need to give them a description of the treatment you feel is necessary. You need to ask about possible, you need to tell them about any possible risks associated with the treatment. You need to give them the availability of alternative treatments and you need to give them the possible consequences of refusing treatment. A lot of times we do not want to talk about what could happen and one of the things that could happen is that they could die. That is a consequence of refusal of care, especially if their condition is life-threatening, that you could die if you don't get treated. Okay, You can say that. You can document that. Don't give that as the only consequence because there are far more than that. Just keep that in mind. Don't be afraid to tell a patient that if they don't get appropriate treatment, they could die. Before you leave a scene where the patient, parent, or caregiver has refused care, you need to encourage them to allow care. You need to ask them to sign a refusal of care form. You need to document this appropriately in your narrative. And it's very valuable to have a witness in these situations. If all else fails, use your EMT partner. However, try to have a third party witness, a family member, um, a, you know, somebody else, a neighbor, a law enforcement officer, or a firefighter, somebody that doesn't work for your service. Because this way, that gives you third party information that you did what you were supposed to do and that the patient is who signed the form. The next section is confidentiality. Probably the next biggest thing that can be litigated is violation of patient confidentiality. Information should always remain confidential between you and your patient. In most states, records may be released only if the patient signs a written release of records form, if you get a legal subpoena presented to you, or if it is needed by billing personnel. Basically, continuity of care and to provide billing for your services. A release might not be required if another healthcare worker needs to know information to continue care or if there is a state law that requires reporting rape or abuse. For example, we go to the hospital with a patient and we hand off information about the patient to the ER staff. This is allowed under not having a written release or a subpoena because we are providing continuity of care for our patients. This is going on down the track. They're getting to continue their care in the healthcare setting. Um, if your state law requires that you report certain things, certain types of injuries, and in Montana you need to know what mandatory reporting laws are. For example, the things in Montana that are mandatory that we report is any type of abuse of a child or an elder person. So elder abuse and child abuse, be it physical abuse, especially physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, emotional abuse is a lot harder to prove, but if you suspect it, you need to report it. Um, gunshot wounds are required reporting in Montana. Sexual assault is not unless, again, it involves a, a child, somebody under the age of 18, or an elderly person who is being cared for by someone else. So those are the things that you need to remember. 
If you release information, you may be liable for breach of confidentiality, which is the disclosure of information without proper authorization. HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, is the law that we must follow regarding patient care. HIPAA contains a section on patient privacy that strengthens privacy laws. This is the form you have to sign every time you go anywhere about your privacy rights. HIPAA safeguards patient confidentiality. It provides guidance on what types of information are protected, what the responsibilities are of the healthcare providers regarding the protection, the penalties for breaching that protection. Those are the things that it gives us guidance on. HIPAA considers all patient information you obtain in the course of providing medical treatment to a patient to be protected health information. Protected health information includes medical information and any information that can be used to identify the patient. So if your agency has a policy on reviewing runs that are significant, you need to be sure that that protected health information is not given out so that the patient may not be identified in any way, shape, or form. The next section is on advanced directives. An advanced directive is something that gives you the right or gives the patient the right to deci decide and make treatment decisions prior to the need to do so. Occasionally, we may respond to a call where a patient is dying from an illness. When we get on scene, family members may not want you to resuscitate the patient. A DNR order, also known as a do not attempt resuscitation order, gives permission not to resuscitate. In Montana, we operate under what is called POLST, Physicians Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment. That is the universal DNR for the state of Montana and it actually travels with the patient no matter where they go from the hospital, the doctor's office, at home, the extended care facility or the rehab facility. This one piece of paper can follow them around. We don't have a separate one for EMS anymore. We have one particular form. Do not resuscitate does not mean do not treat. Even in the presence of a DNR order, you are still obligated to provide supportive measures like oxygen, pain relief, and comfort care to a patient who is not in cardiac arrest whenever possible. A competent patient makes his or her own decisions and advanced directives specifies the treatment should the patient become unconscious or be unable. An advanced directive may also be referred to as a living will or a health care directive. Some patients may have actually named surrogates or someone else to make decisions for them when they can no longer make decisions on their own. Durable powers of attorney for health care are one of these advanced directives and they are also known as health care proxies. Because of terminal nursing home placement, hospice, and home health programs, you may see this situation quite often. When presented with an advanced directive, you should never become annoyed with family members. The patients and their families should be treated with the utmost respect and empathy. Sometimes you will have us come, oh, EMS will be called to a scene where the patient is dying um, or has died and the family is not ready to let them go. And even though they have this advanced directive or they have this, this form that says, I don't want anything done, the family wants you to do something. And so you find yourself in a dilemma of having to deal with this and how you handle this Again, you must be respectful and empathetic to both the family um, and any bystanders on the scene. We talked about this a little bit in our last lecture about BLS, um, physical signs of death. Determination of the cause of death is the medical responsibility of a physician, not an EMT. In the absence of a physician's orders, the general rule is if the body is still warm and intact, initiate emergency medical care. Cold temperature hypothermia emergencies are an exception to this rule. The thing you have to realize is in Montana, we get a lot of cold temperatures, okay? And so even in the summertime, um, cold can be a factor in what we see. Some of the presumptive signs of death that we may see are a patient who is unresponsive to pain. They do not have a carotid pulse or a heartbeat. They do not have breath sounds. They're not breathing. They have no deep tendon or corneal reflexes. They have no eye movement. They have no systolic blood pressure. They have profound cyanosis or bluing of the skin and their body temperature is lowered or decreased. Definitive signs of death, this is the same picture we looked at yesterday, um, show um, things like if the body is in parts, it's been decapitated, the head's been cut off. Dependent lividity, which refers to the blood settling to the lowest point of the body, causing discoloration of the skin, and I explained this to you in the lecture yesterday on BLS resuscitation. Uh, rigor mortis. 
which is that stiffening of the body to where you can't straighten limbs or anything and the patient has been dead for some time. Um, it's caused by chemical changes within muscle tissue and it occurs between 2 and 12 hours after death in general. So this takes a long time. If you see a patient with rigor mortis, they've been dead longer than we could ever hopefully successfully resuscitate them. And the last one is putrefaction or decomposition. This um, depends on temperature conditions, can happen between 40 and 96 hours after death. So somebody's been dead a long time before their body starts decomposing. Medical examiner cases. Involvement depends um, on, upon the nature and scene of the death. Now in Montana, we do not have a medical examiner system that comes to the scene. We have a coroner system and the coroner is generally an elected official. In Flathead County, the coroner is part of the office of the sheriff and the sheriff is the coroner. And the sheriff can appoint people to be deputy coroners so that the sheriff doesn't come out on every dead body call but they do have to respond. And it doesn't matter where the person died. It doesn't matter if it's in the city or the county. If it is a death that needs a coroner involvement, the sheriff's office responds no matter where that is. In most states, the medical examiner or the coroner, in some states, must be notified in the following cases. The patient is dead on arrival, sometimes called dead on the scene, um, whether we pronounce him on the scene or take him to the hospital. Death without previous medical care or when the physician is unable to give a cause of death. Suicide or self-destruction. Violent deaths. Poisonings, known or suspected. Death from accidents and suspicion of criminal acts. If emergency medical care has been initiated, be sure to keep thorough notes of what was done or found. This will be provided to the coroner. In Montana, we do have a medical examiner. He works out of the um, medical examiner's office in Missoula. We have one medical examiner for the state, Dr. Gary Dale. Uh, he may have some assistance, but not every case of death goes to the medical examiner's office. In other states, that's the big office, and they have offices all over the state, but here we have a single medical examiner office system, and the county coroners decide what cases need to be sent down for investigation. Some other special situations we're going to need to talk about. Um, organ donors. This is an expressed wish by a patient to donate organs. You can find this information um, on a donor card or on the driver's license. In Montana, each one of you, even if you're underage, have the right to designate yourself as an organ donor. We treat organ donors the same as any other patient. A lot of times people don't want to be organ donors because they're afraid we won't do our job. Remember, that has nothing to do with how we do our job. Your priority is saving the patient's life. And remember, organs need oxygen. If you do nothing, their organs are not going to be useful at all. Nothing that they can do. You may all see medical identification insignia. This is an example of an organ donor card. Um, and again, it's in Montana, it's on your driver's license. So medical ID insignia, bracelets, necklaces, or cards may indicate DNR, do not resuscitate orders, may indicate allergies, may indicate conditions like diabetes or epilepsy or some other serious medical condition. These are very helpful in patient assessment and treatment, especially if the patient can't communicate with you. This is an example of a Wisconsin DNR um, EMS bracelet. Scope of practice in pre-hospital care in emergency medicine for pre-hospital providers. This outlines the care you are able to provide. It is usually defined by state law. The medical director further defines this by developing protocols and standing orders for us to operate under. And the authorization to provide care um, is given by a medical director via telephone or radio, which is considered online medical direction, or through those same standing orders and protocols, which is considered offline medical direction. If you carry out procedures outside the scope of practice, this may be considered negligence or a criminal offense that you can be charged. So you can face both civil and criminal litigation in these instances. And the other thing I want to caution you on is to not confuse scope of practice with standards of care, which are what a reasonable EMT in a similar situation would do. Okay, remember, um, standard of care is a reasonable EMT in a similar situation would do this. Okay, that's not scope of practice. That's reasonableness and standard of care. And that's the next thing that we're going to discuss. So with standard of care, the manner in which you must act or behave is called the standard of care. The law requires you to act or behave toward other individuals in a definite, definable way, regardless of the activity that is involved. 
Generally speaking, you need to be concerned about safety and welfare of others when your behavior or activities can potentially cause others injury or harm. There are many ways that the standard of care can be established. This can include local custom. Basically what this means is how a reasonably prudent person with similar training and experience would act under similar circumstances with similar equipment and in the same or similar place. This is called the reasonable person standard. Statutes or laws. In many states this may take the form of treatment protocols. You need to be familiar with the particular legal standards in your state. Professional or institutional standards. These are recommendations published by organizations and societies that are involved in emergency medical care. For example, the CPR guidelines for class that you're going to do your CPR training, these are established by the American Heart Association. Most textbooks, sorry, let me go back to that uh, professional or institutional standards, just one second, about AHA guidelines. There are specific rules and procedures of the EMS service, ambulance service, or organization to which you are attached. An example of a professional standard is AHA standard for BLS and CPR. Okay. Now when we talk about textbooks, there are standards imposed by text. Most textbooks follow the standards that have been historically established by the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. These textbooks are often recognized as contributing to the standard of care that is followed by EMTs. However, your local protocols may differ. The EMT is always bound by local protocol. Standards imposed by states, including the Medical Practices Act. In some states, the EMT is exempt from the licensure requirements of the Medical Practices Act because an EMT is regarded as a non-medical professional. In Montana, we are licensed to practice medicine. The practice of medicine is defined as the diagnosis and treatment of an illness or disease. Certification and licensure. Certification is a process by which an individual institution or program is evaluated and recognized as meeting predetermined standards to ensure safe and ethical care. So your national certification exam is a certification. And then in Montana you can apply for licensure. And licensure is the process by which a competent authority, usually the state, and in our situation it's the Board of Medical Examiners, grants permission to practice a job, trade, or profession. The next section regards duty to act. A duty to act is an individual's responsibility to provide patient care. Responsibility comes from either statute or function. A bystander is under no obligation to assist a stranger in distress. There is no duty to act. Once your ambulance responds to a call or treatment has begun, you have a legal duty to act. In most cases, if you are off duty and come upon a crash, you are not legally obligated to stop and assist patients However, there may be some circumstances where this is not true, and you should be familiar with the laws and policies that apply in your service area. Duty to act is one of the four elements of the um, civil tort of negligence. Negligence is the failure to provide the same care that a person with similar training would provide in the same or similar situation. All four of the following factors must be present for the legal doctrine of negligence to apply and for a plaintiff to prevail in a lawsuit against an EMS, or an EMS service or provider. The first is duty, that is that obligation to provide care. The second is that you breached that duty. That means that the EMT does not act within an expected and reasonable standard of care. The third element is damages, that means there must have been some type of harm caused either physically or psychologically, in some noticeable way. It does not necessarily mean injury. And then the causation element is a cause and effect relationship between breach of duty and the damages. Your failure to provide what you should have provided is what led to this type of injury or, or circumstance. Okay, So that's that um, causation issue. Negligence is a general category law known as a tort. Torts are civil wrongs. Other tort actions are suits for defamation of character and invasion of privacy, which can be um, something we deal with as a result of HIPAA. Under the next section, we want to talk about some other things, like abandonment. Abandonment is a unilateral termination of care by the EMT without the patient's consent and without making any provision for care to be continued by a medical professional who is competent to provide care for the patient. Once care has begun, 
you assume a duty that must not stop until an equally competent EMS provider assumes responsibility. Failure to perform that duty is a serious legal and ethical matter and can result in civil action against you. Abandonment may happen at the scene or also in the emergency department when you are dropping off your patient. At the scene, it would be because you left and didn't transport the patient without going through the proper procedure of refusal. In the emergency department, dropping a patient off in a bed without someone from the emergency department staff assuming care of that patient and then there being an untoward event, you abandon that patient. Patients always must be handed off to the next level of care. Assault and battery and kidnapping. These are both criminal and civil actions. And realize that even though there is this thing called double jeopardy that you can't be tried for the same crime more than once, if you are charged under a civil action and then charged under a criminal action, that is not double jeopardy. They're two different sides of the law. Assault is unlawfully placing a person in fear of immediate bodily harm. For example, restraint. This can happen if you threaten to restrain a patient who does not want to be transported. So you need to know your laws regarding patient restraint. Battery is unlawfully touching of a person. So this can happen when you provide care without consent. This is why consent is one of the first things we talk about and it's very important you understand that you need to get consent. Kidnapping is seizing, confining, abducting, or carrying away by force. In other words, this could happen when you transport a patient against their will. A false imprisonment charge is more likely because EMTs are almost always acting in good faith to provide care, but realize that the crime of kidnapping is criminal and false imprisonment is civil. False imprisonment is the unauthorized confinement of a person. There are serious legal problems that may arise in situations in which a patient has not given consent for treatment or transport. That's why consent was one of the first things we covered in this chapter. Defamation of character. Defamation is the communication of false information that damages a person's reputation. It is termed libel if it's written. It is termed slander if it is spoken. It can arise out of a false statement on a run report, inappropriate comments made during a station house conversation. These are ways this can happen. So realize that your documentation has to be solid, and if you falsify your run report, your integrity comes under question. Be sure that your run report is accurate, relevant, and factual, and only communicate information about your, persons, your patients to authorized persons. For example, patients under the use of drugs or alcohol, um, we may want to say the person was drunk. Well, that's very difficult to prove, but what you can legally say is the patient admitted to alcohol intake or the patient admitted to drinking two beers. Whatever the patient tells you, document that appropriately in your narrative, but you don't get to make subjective observations. We only make objective, which is fact. Subjective is opinion, and we only want to make objective observations regarding our patients. And then again, only communicate to patients or uh, information about your patients to those who are authorized under HIPAA. The next section is Good Sam. Good Samaritan laws and immunity are something you need to have an understanding of. Good Samaritan laws are based on the common law principle that when you reasonably help another person, you should not be held liable for errors or omissions that are made in giving care. Most states have some type of Good Samaritan legislation. To be protected by provisions of the Good Samaritan law, several conditions must generally be met. You must have acted in good faith in rendering care. You rendered care without expectation of compensation. And depending on the state, this does not include your salary. Okay, You being paid to be an EMT is not considered compensation by your patient. You acted within the scope of your training, and you did not act in a grossly negligent manner. Gross negligence is defined as a conduct that constitutes a willful or reckless disregard for a duty or standard of care. Another group of laws grants immunity from liability to official EMS providers, such as EMTs. These laws do not provide immunity when injury or damage is caused by gross negligence or willful misconduct. And the laws do vary, so you need to consult with your medical director for more information about laws in your area. So as you can see on the screen right now, this is what Montana Code Annotated 2013, these are our Montana state laws, says regarding limits on liability for emergency care rendered at the scene of an accident or emergency. 
This clearly states that any person licensed as a physician and surgeon under the laws of the state of Montana, any volunteer firefighter or officer of a nonprofit volunteer fire company, or any other person who in good faith renders emergency care or assistance without compensation, except as provided in subsection 2 at the scene of an emergency or accident, is not liable for any civil damages for acts or omissions other than damages occasioned by gross negligence or by willful or wanton acts or omissions by the person in rendering the emergency care or assistance. So subsection 2 says, subsection 1 includes a person properly trained under the laws of the states who operates an ambulance to and from the scene of an emergency or renders emergency medical treatment on a volunteer basis, so long as the total reimbursement received for the services does not exceed 25% of the person's gross annual income or $3,000 a calendar year, whichever is greater. The other section to this that needs to be looked at is a nonprofit subscription fire company. In other words, you are a nonprofit fire department and you have subscribers in your district that pay for your services. If they refuse to fight a fire on non-subscriber property, your neighbor doesn't pay and you do. The refusal of that does not constitute gross negligence or a willful or wanton act or omission. Now this is 2013 and most EMS services in Montana are still volunteer. However, in, in our area there are quite a few who are paid and people make more than $3,000 a year. It's important that you realize that if that is the case, this is one of those things that we need to be aware of that can be an issue and you need to check with your local medical director on this. Yes. Moving on, the next section we're going to talk about is records and reports. You should compile a complete and accurate record of all incidents involving sick or injured patients. Such a record is an important safeguard against legal complications. And the court's perception of records and reports is that if an action or procedure was not recorded on the written report, you didn't do it. If it was not written, it was not done. Incomplete or untidy reports are evidence of incomplete or inexpert emergency medical care. This is how the court reviews this. One of the things that you need to be aware of is handwriting is an issue. So people are going to electronic medical records and an electronic report is very clean, but make sure that your documentation um, is appropriate grammar and spelling, also very important. As I said, the courts do consider that if you didn't write it, it wasn't done. And you can see, let's go back um, here. This is an example on the left is good documentation of a handwritten report. This shows poor documentation. One of the things we do not do is we do not scribble something out to where it cannot be read. If you make an error on a report, you draw a single line through the error and you initial it, and then you make the correction off to the side. It is very important. As you can see here, this is appropriate um, correction of an error, and this and this are inappropriate. Special mandatory reporting requirements. Many states, actually most of them, have a reporting obligation for certain individuals ranging from physicians to any person. The following special mandatory reporting requirements may vary from state to state. Okay, These are the things you need to know about. And I will tell you what in Montana um, we do know about and what we don't. Number one, Abuse. Any type of child abuse, elder abuse, or at-risk adults, those mentally incapacitated, something like that. That is requirement, most states and Montana included. Injury during the commission of a felony. So if a crime like a felony has been committed, you may want to let local law enforcement know. Drug-related injuries and childbirth. These are not mandatory reporting in Montana unless the drug-related injury is a result of a felony, Attempted suicides. Basically, any time we get dispatched to an attempted suicide, um, we have law enforcement responding. Uh, it is not required for us to report these, unless it's by gunshot. Dog bites, absolutely mandatory reporting in most states and Montana. Communicable diseases, not necessarily, and it's not required. That's up to the hospital. Assaults, again, unless it involves a child, an elder adult, or somebody who is mentally incapacitated, this is not your call. Domestic violence, also not your call. I know this is a huge ethical issue because, you know, what happens if you report it and then it um, escalates and somebody dies? Um, domestic violence is not mandatory reporting. Sexual assault, again, unless it involves a child, an elderly adult, or somebody that is being cared for who is mentally incapacitated, you do not have a mandatory obligation to report. Exposure to infectious disease, follow your local policies. 
Transport of patient in restraints. This needs to be reported to medical control every time. Um, scene of a crime. If a crime has been committed, you need to notify law enforcement and also the deceased. We do notify the coroner on all of these. They don't always come out. Ethical responsibilities. In addition to the legal duties of an EMT, we have certain ethical responsibilities as healthcare providers. These responsibilities are to themselves, their co-workers, the public, and the patient. So we have a responsibility to ourselves. We have a responsibility to our partners, our co-workers, the public, and the patient. Ethics is the philosophy of right and wrong, moral obligations, and the ideal professional behavior. Morality is the code of conduct affecting character, conduct, and conscience. Bioethics specifically addresses ethical issues that arise in the practice of health care. EMTs are going to encounter ethical dilemmas. There's no way around it. Such dilemmas require you to evaluate and apply ethical standards. You need to apply your own as well as those of our profession. You need to be honest in your reporting. You need to allow rules, laws, and policies to guide how you make decisions, and your records must be kept accurately. In court. So all of this medical, legal, ethical stuff is to help you not end up in court, but sometimes you can anyway. You can end up in court as an EMT, as a witness, a defendant, or the case can be civil or criminal. Whether you are subpoenaed to testify in any court proceeding, you should immediately notify your service director and legal counsel. As a witness, you need to remain neutral during your testimony and only give factual evidence. You need to review the run report before your court appearance. It's very important. As a defendant, you need an attorney. The attorney is generally supplied by your service in a civil suit under their professional liability policies. Your defenses may include some things like statute of limitations, the time within which a case must be commenced. Governmental immunity, generally applied to municipalities or other governmental entities. If your service is covered by immunity, it may mean that you cannot be sued at all or that it would limit the amount of monetary judgment recovered. Contributory negligence. A legal defense that may be raised when the defendant feels that the conduct of the plaintiff somehow contributed to injuries or damages sustained by the plaintiff. The plaintiff is the person initiating the suit. Discovery. An opportunity for both sides to obtain more information to reach a better understanding of the case. Discovery includes interrogatories, which are written requests or questions, and depositions, which are done orally. And they're done under oath, and they're done with attorneys present and with a court reporter. Most cases are settled following the discovery phase during a settlement phase and do not go to trial. However, for those that do, several types of damages may be awarded, including compensatory damages. These are intended to restore the plaintiff to the same condition he or she was in prior to the incident. And then there are punitive damages, and punitive are intended to punish. These are intended to deter the defendant from repeating the behavior and are reserved for cases where the defendant had acted intentionally or with reckless disregard for the safety of the public. These damages are not commonly awarded in negligence cases, however they may be. In summary, the things you need to remember regarding medical, legal, and ethical issues are consent is generally required from every conscious adult before care can be started. The foundation of consent is decision-making capacity. You should never withhold life-saving care unless a valid DNR order is present. A parent or legal guardian must give consent for treatment or transport of a minor. Conscious alert patients do have the right to refuse treatment or withdraw their treatment consent. Patient communication is confidential and generally cannot be disclosed without permission from the patient or a court order. Advanced directives, living wills, or health care directives are often used when a patient becomes comatose. There are both definitive and presumptive signs of death. In many states, death is defined as the absence of circulatory and respiratory functions. A donor card or driver's license indicates consent to organ donation. The standard of care is established in many ways, including local customs, statutes, ordinances, protocols, textbooks, administrative regulations, and case law. The scope of practice outlines the care you are able to provide for the patient. When your ambulance responds to a call or treatment has begun, you have a legal duty to act. In most cases, if you are off duty and come upon a crash, you are not legally obligated to stop and assist.
Negligence is based on duty. Breach of duty, damages, and cause. All four elements must be presented for the legal doctrine of negligence to apply and for a plaintiff to prevail in a lawsuit against an EMS service or provider. Abandonment is termination of care without the patient's consent and without provisions for transfer of care to a medical professional with skills at the same level or a higher level than your own. Abandonment is legally and ethically a very serious act. Assault is unlawfully placing a person in fear of immediate bodily harm. Battery is unlawfully touching a person, which includes providing care without consent. Good Samaritan laws protect individuals who stop to render aid. Records and reports are important, particularly if a case goes to court. Courts consider an action or procedure that was not recorded on the written report as not having been performed, and an incomplete or untidy report is considered evidence of incompetent or inexpert medical care. You should know special reporting requirements for abuse of children, the elderly and others, injuries related to crimes, drug related injuries, and childbirth in your area. You must meet legal and ethical responsibilities when caring for patients' physical and emotional needs. And as an EMT, a number of situations might cause you to end up in court either as a witness or defendant in a civil lawsuit or as a witness or defendant in a criminal case. I hope you've gained some valuable information during this lecture. Um, the next section that we're going to do is I'm going to um, give a lecture that will be separate from this one regarding Montana's Pulse or our DNR form. I have a little PowerPoint for that I'll go over with you. Um, this is something you definitely need to be aware of for what goes on in the state of Montana regarding um, do not resuscitate orders for patients. Thank you.